Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have uh, several announcements that uh, you just, not big ones, but we'll just go through them. Uh, first, we do have a rollers meeting here uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, it is a regularly scheduled one. It's the first one we've had since January, I think. Okay, so it, it is nice that we do this and good that we do this and we need to do this. So we're going to do that. It's going to be in church after the second service. Um, or after the Monday service, excuse me, and what we will do is get everybody out of the room and then we will do the cleaning we normally do and then once that's dry, we'll come back in, okay, so that there will be decontamination uh, occurring for that. So please do count on that. Also, we have Bible study tonight. We have a, uh, I'll be getting out the information again, the contact on that or the way to log in, so please remember that. Also, uh, we have... Uh, uh, we had our golf outing yesterday. We, we had a lot of people for that. We thank God for that. We thank you all those people who helped organize it and run that. That was a great gift to our church and school. And finally, uh, on the back of your bulletins, if you look at the back, you'll see there's a big thing about vid helping videotape our services. Uh, or record them. I guess it's really not videotaping anymore. We would like more help. There's a contact number on there. Uh, we had tons of people saying how much they appreciated this uh, when we were not able to meet in person, and many people are still using it. And so please, if you're interested in helping, um, there's, you know, kind of we would like, you know, mature high schoolers and older to very mature older people as well. So if you are interested in that, please. Uh, do consider that. So right now, give us our new greeting as we greet one another.
open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. His anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved.
what profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. A reading from 1 Kings chapter 17. This takes place after the last week's story of, of Elijah going to the well of Jerophath and promising the food to be given to them throughout the time of drought. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to, bring, come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up in the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, 
have you brought calamity even upon this widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from Ephesians chapter 3. St. Paul writes, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner beings, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God.
we rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. In a reading from Luke chapter 7, and we read together. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bearer. And the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us. God has visited his people. And this report of him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. <laughs> Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Our text begins with a funeral procession, a parade of death on a collision course with the Lord of life. From one direction comes death, from the other direction comes life. Now, you do know what you're supposed to do when you see that funeral procession. You're supposed to step aside. You're supposed to quietly get out of the way. But not this time. No, in defiance of death, Jesus stands in the way. He refuses to submit to death's authority. He halts the procession. He, he physically stops it, placing his hand against the platform. And then, with merely a word, he cancels the funeral. And in so doing, Jesus proves that he is stronger than death and that he can stand up to that bully named death. Do you know what Jesus calls death in many other places? He calls it sleep. Why? Well, first, to show that it's temporary, that it's only for a while. Second, to show that he can wake us back up. And third, he calls death sleep to mock death, to say to the bully, you think you can keep my people down? Ha! How cute! I'll nickname you Sleep, for you are nothing more than a nice nap. And I will awaken my people easily with only a word. Jesus can wake us up easily. Consider this. Is it not true that some people are such heavy sleepers that it takes a lot of effort to wake them up? When I was a teenager, my mom really had to shake me and pat me to get me up. 
But in our text, Jesus wakes the boy easily and instantly with only a word. For it is easier for Jesus to wake you up from death than it is for you to get yourself out of the bed each morning. Therefore, you can be confident that on the final day, Jesus will speak that word and all believers will spring to life and we will stand by his side. Death will not be able to hold us down. For in Jesus, death can harm you no more than your pillow does each night. That's why we put little pillows in our caskets. That's why we put on the tombstone, R.I.P., rest in peace. It is to mock death, to put him on notice that our Jesus is stronger O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, grave, where is your sting? My Jesus is stronger than you, for he has died for me, and he has rose for me, and he promises me eternal life. Yes, this Jesus will undo our deaths. He will take away all sorrows. He will wipe away all tears. He will cancel all funerals and raise us to live with him forever. And on that final day, we will live as a perfect family. Just as Jesus restored this boy to his mother, Jesus will restore you with your loved ones in the faith. He will restore this family on that final day. And you will be my brothers and my sisters forever. Also, we should notice what motivates our Lord to help. Does the poor mother ask for his help? Does she even know that he can help? Does she expect him to help? As far as she knows, all hope is lost. So why does he help? Well, the answer in our text is compassion. When Jesus saw her, he had compassion. He was gut-wrenched. His spleen hurt. He was deeply moved. Her pain became his pain. He experienced the widow's grief. For he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yes, of all people, Jesus is the only one who loves his neighbor as himself. Is this true of us? No, not really. If something terrible happens to our neighbor, we might care, but not as much as we would care as if it happened to us. So, for example, if your neighbor's child died, you might be moved, but not as much as if your own child died. But not so with Jesus. For him, your suffering is his suffering. Christ sees your pain, and he shares it completely. He weeps alongside of you. Indeed, he hates the death of your loved ones even more than you hate it. I like to point out that as far as we know, Jesus ruined every funeral he ever attended. This one, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, and his own. Every time that Jesus encounters death, he conquers it. He sends it packing, for, he's, for he hates death. He hates to see how it hurts you. Indeed, with Lazarus, he weeps, even knowing that he's about to undo it. Jesus truly shares your pain. In fact, he is so willing to share your pain that he became man. He experienced the full range of human suffering. Whatever you have felt, he has felt it equally and much, much more. 
So it's not only that he loves you and your family as much as you love them, he actually loves you all more. What an amazing Lord who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and he was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and he was made man and was crucified also for us. Therefore, today we marvel at the love of God. St. Paul talked about that in our epistle reading. Can anyone comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of God? However much you imagine he loves you, think bigger. He loves you so much more. And so St. Paul prays that we might begin to comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of God. Breadth and length, well, that forms the shape of a cross covering the four cardinal directions. But then Paul adds height, which reaches up into the heavens, and even depth that reaches down into the earth. And today we heard about how Christ's love reached down into the grave to show the depth of God's love, raising the widow's son. For truly there is nowhere that a believer can go where the Father's love will not be found. This God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or even imagine. The widow at Nain, she didn't ask for a miracle. She didn't think it could happen. But the Father's love reached beyond her imagination. And the same is true for us. This same God promises to do for us even more than we can imagine when Christ returns on that final day. You know, our little brains cannot fathom what that's going to be like, what eternal life will be like. So the Bible usually describes it by what it's not. It's not sorrow. It's not sicknesses. It's not death. There will be no pain and no sin. There will be no anger, no strife, no wars, no politics, no anxiety, no fears. And the reason why God tells us what it's not is because our minds cannot fathom what he has in store for us. Think about this. St. Paul says that the sufferings of this present time aren't even worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. This from a man who was imprisoned, flogged, and beaten with rods, who was hungry and without clothes, shipwrecked, chased by enemies. He was once stoned and he lived through it, constantly abused, suffering great anxieties. And this man says that the sufferings now don't even compare Hair with the glory that is to come. And not only will God bless us after the suffering, God even blesses us during the suffering, in the midst of our suffering. For in suffering, He is disciplining us. He is discipling us. He is teaching us. He is training us to long for Him and to long for eternity. Is it not true that in the hard times, we pray a bit more? <laughs> we think about Him more. We search the Scriptures more. We cling to the promises more. So then, even during the worst times, in the most evil of things, God is at work bringing us closer to Him, setting our minds on the things above, and upon Christ the crucified. Do you think your current suffering is all that God has planned for you? I pray that you begin to comprehend the breadth and the width and the height and the depth of the love of God, for He is able to do far more abundantly than what you think or ask or imagine. And not only will there be glory after your suffering, but even in the midst of the suffering, God is working in your life, 
working all things for your good, you who are called according to his purposes. If you want proof of this, just think about the cross. If you had been there that day, you would have thought that nothing good could have come from that. It was the most evil of all days. It did not seem like Good Friday. It was the worst Friday. How could a good God allow that to happen? It would have been easy to doubt God. And yet in that very moment, God's love was doing its greatest work. That very moment, God was saving you and creating for you a path to eternal life. By that suffering, he was forgiving you all your sins, including the sin of doubting his love. By that cross, he was proving to you that he's truly at work for your good, even in the evil times, that he has a plan for the fullness of time to bring all things together in Christ. And if only we would keep trusting him, we would not be disappointed. For this Jesus can conquer sin. This Jesus can conquer death, and he promises to reach down into your grave and to raise you up. As he himself says, whoever looks on the Son and believes, you have eternal life, and I will raise you up on the last day. What a loving and patient and compassionate God who loves me even when I've doubted him when I've doubted his goodness. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And just as he is compassionate towards us and in the widow, to the widow in the text, we ought to imitate him and be compassionate towards all. It's truly sad that we are so self-absorbed that we are much more in tune with our own pain than the pains of those around us. Friends, let's not be like that. Let's be like Jesus. St. Paul says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. We are to weep with those who weep. As a church, God has made us a family, and we have the honor of sharing our joys and our sorrows with one another. When one member of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. When you stub your toe, does not your whole body hurt? In a similar way, let us be so compassionate that when one of us hurts, we all hurt. And when one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. And in so doing, the bonds of love will be strengthened and we will all get ready for that world to come where love will never fail. Sadly, we're not there yet. I confess, I do not yet love you as I ought. But I long for that world where I will love you even as I have been loved. And I pray that even now, God would work in my heart and yours as well, that we might know the breadth and the width and the height and the depth of his boundless love, that his love might well up in our hearts and then overflow to those around us. Lord, grant this to us all. Amen. We now stand to sing.
At this time, we worship the Lord with our offering and invite you to bring them forward. You may be seated. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed to be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry O Lord, we pray that your grace may always go before and follow after us, that we may continually be given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, that you looked upon us before we even knew what to ask and that in your mercy you have given your Son to die for us, that with sins forgiven we may live with joy now and in anticipation of the day that you will call all from the grave and give eternity of blessed life to all who have died in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for having gathered this family together here at St. John. We pray that we would continue steadfastly to, to give thanks and praise to you for the gifts bestowed upon us. Today we give you thanks for Keith Harris, Jordan and Taylor Hashley, Vicki Hastings, Jacob Heights, Jade Helton family. 
And we pray that they would always know your love, your grace, and your compassion, and that together as a family of God, we may rejoice in eternity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our mission and ministry here would never be forsaken, but that we might always seek to proclaim your word. We pray that you would bless those missions that we support, especially this month, Pablo, the people of the book, Lutheran Outreach, as they reach into communities uh, that do not know your love in Christ. And we pray that by your goodness, they would always seek to make known your name clearly and without compromise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, uh, with thanksgiving for the gifts of this life you have given us. We thank you for the birthday of Joanne and pray that she might celebrate many more. May she always be filled with the love of Christ and share that love with all, and that together we might rejoice in all of your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the one who grants health and healing as you see fit. You did so through your son Jesus as he walked this earth and performed the miracles that he did. You did so as he raised even the dead as they lay and people mourned. So we pray this day that you would indeed work your health and healing upon those for whom we pray. For Doris and Barbara who are hospitalized, for Virginia as Millar who is hospitalized as well, that you'd be with Margaret and Ruth and Don and Ron, Annalise and Ron, Jim, Nancy and Nancy, Debbie, Ezra and Jim and Joyce, that by your goodness they might grow in faith and love even in the midst of their suffering and that they may anticipate the day in faith that will come to all who die knowing Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that, Lord, you would bless this nation, that you would grant to us a spirit of repentance and humility, that we had come to you always looking for your goodness in Jesus, confessing our sin and seeking your mercy for his sake. We pray that our president and our governor and all those in positions to rule and govern might have wisdom and understanding and good and counsel. We pray for those who are interpreting the laws, that they might do so in ways that do not betray agendas, but rather by your goodness might indeed um, seek justice for all. We pray that you be of those who serve to help, all those who are EMTs, police officers, those who are firefighters, doctors, nurses, and all who care for your people, that they might be agents of health and healing and peace in this life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, for uh, our church body, that you be with the synodical president, Matthew Harrison, and our district president, David Meyer, that they might indeed lead us into a true confession of that faith and a faithful walk that proclaims Christ in all that we do. Be with the leaders of this congregation, that we might always bow before your word, knowing that there Christ crucified resides, and he alone is the way of salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, be with Detroit and those of us in her region, that you might work peace and repentance and justice give understanding hearts and ears that there might be a compromise and work to those things that are necessary to bring not only jobs and, uh, into our midst, but that there might be indeed peace and acceptance amongst all. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power. And grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, to one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.